Thank you so much for coming. My name is Esther Northman, and I have the pleasure and honor of being Vice President for Programming. Now I'm probably going to get caught in this microphone wire. Vice President of Programming for the Hebrew Congregation of Chautauqua. I usually say, thank you so much for coming, despite the rain and the cold. So tonight, I'm going to say, thank you so much for coming, despite the heat. But we'll keep it nice and cool, although the topic will be nice and warm. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth Sunday of our Hebrew Congregation of Chautauqua's Sunday Evening Shirley Lazarus Speaker Series. We have one more in our series next Sunday. How many of you are here for the first time for our speaker series? Wow, that's wonderful. We're really happy to see you and welcome you very, very strongly. Next week, which as I said is our last, unfortunately, last Sunday evening speaker will be Dr. David Levy, which many of you know. He is Professor Emeritus of Music from Wake Forest University and he writes columns about the concerts at Chautauqua every week and gives the pre-concert talk. So that's gonna be a wonderful evening also. And if you're here, please come, it'll be same place. You'll find a listing of all of our events in the brochure, does anybody have one? I thought I had one. Could you hold it up in the blue brochure? So please pick one up if you already don't have one. There are also envelopes in the back. Uh, we have had a difficult summer as far as finances because of COVID, and the institution isn't able to give us the support that we usually get. They give us the support, but we have to pay for it. So if you feel like making a small donation, we'd really appreciate it. We do appreciate some of, oh, there you go. There's Bob with all of the brochures and envelopes. We do appreciate that we're able this summer to use Smith Wilkes Hall for our lectures. That way you can stay outside and stay safe, which is our goal. And it's thanks to the institution and Maureen Ravenio, who is the director of religion, whom we all love. And unfortunately, she couldn't be with us tonight, but our thoughts are with her. After the program tonight, there will be a bus leaving on Foster. It'll be going uphill, so those of you who don't want to walk uphill or feel you'd like some help, feel free to take the bus. It will be leaving at 8.15, and I'll give you a reminder at about 8.10, and then when the bus pulls up, I'll also let you know. Our presenter, speaker, conversationalist tonight Errol Davis has a very impressive resume. Those of you who read on the Briefly and the Daily got to see all the great things that he has done. Well, not even all. They couldn't list them all in that small space. He's a retired senior executive, and he's retired, as I said, so now he's engaged with board, with philanthropic senior executive counseling and consulting work. He served as chancellor of the state of Georgia's university system, which is a huge, huge responsibility, and equally very responsible position, superintendent of Atlantic Public Schools when they were going through quite a crisis that he was instrumental in helping them out of the crisis, and CEO of several major energy companies. He currently resides in Atlanta, with his wife, lovely wife, Elaine. Um, Mr. Davis first came to Chautauqua in 2011 when he was the amphitheater speaker and he fell in love with it, I guess, we're gonna find out. And every year since, he and Elaine have been coming to Chautauqua and we're very grateful for that. Right? <laughs> the format for tonight is different from, for those of you who have come before, we always have a presenter and a talk and then questions. But we're going to be doing another kind of format tonight, which was suggested by Mr. Davis, and I think it will be very interesting. We're going to have a conversation. I'm going to be asking him some questions. Then we'll take maybe a brief pause and take 
two questions from the audience. You'll raise your hands. We'll, um, where's Benjamin? Benjamin will be coming around with a microphone for you. So raise your hand, give me a pretty smile, and I'll come and choose you. And after the official questions between Mr. Davis and myself, there will be a regular question and answer period where you, if you didn't get chosen before, you'll be able to ask your questions. Before we start our conversation, I'd like you to start thinking of topics that are relevant to our evening tonight. Okay, so please raise your hands if you have ever discussed issues of racism within your family. That's great. Please raise your hands if you have ever personally experienced racism. I'm so sorry. Please raise your hands if you have ever experienced religious discrimination. And please raise your hands if you've ever personally experienced gender discrimination. And please raise your hands if you've ever experienced any other form of racism. Okay, I guess maybe I covered the other time <laughs> with my four other items. And so you know what racism and discrimination feels like. Thank you so much for sharing. That was very good. We'll now begin our conversation. And of course, please silence all mobile phones and electronic devices. Mr. Davis, would you please stand up and be welcomed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start with a question that some people have mentioned to me. They wanted to know how you became... Well, well before you start. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll give you, you a chance to... Yeah. <laughs> you can ask me I'm a question. I was supposed to say something like, Mishtana halayla hazech mekalalilos. Because it's 81 degrees on Sunday evening. Okay. Uh, I am pleased to be here. and Thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward uh, to the questions. I'm looking forward to asking them. <laughs> Question one. Why did you continue coming to Chautauqua rather than going to Martha's Vineyard where a lot of African American people go and <laughs> feel more comfortable in the environment? What about Chautauqua kept you here, fortunately for us? Well, as you mentioned, I came in 2011 as a uh, speaker and while I was speaking, my wife was not listening to me, which is a normal state. Uh, but uh, she was out and about, and she was observing all of the pillars uh, and the literature and the dancing and the, and the music. And I was essentially voluntold that I was coming back uh, the, ne <laughs> the next year, uh, which we did. Um, uh, we came back for one week. Uh, two years in a row, then we, I was told we needed a longer period of time here. <laughs> so then we came back for two weeks, two years in a row, then I was told we were going to build a house uh, here. And so uh, I've been married for 53 years, so I just say yes, dear. <laughs> well, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you again, Elaine. Could you please tell us a little bit about the history of African Americans at Chautauqua and also a little bit about the development, how it came about of the African American Heritage House? Uh, well, let me, that's, that's a, uh, an excellent question, which uh, of course is what you say when you're fumbling for an answer uh, in your mind. <laughs> Uh, the history of African Americans at Chautauqua is essentially an unwritten history. The African American Heritage House, with the support uh, of our many friends and donors, has done archival research over the last couple years, and we were quite astounded uh, by what we discovered in terms of the numbers of African Americans and their roles here. And our archival research culminated this summer, of course, with the dedication uh, of a plaque marking the last known location of the Phyllis Wheatley uh, house. Uh, 
the African American Heritage House in its uh, many carnations is probably 10 years old. Uh, and the original model was to, uh, and again, this, uh, people like Joan Brown Campbell and Robert Franklin uh, and others were involved. And the idea was to have an African American denominational house, although I found it quizzical that African Americans were a denomination uh, at, at that point. Uh, but the thought, the business model was that a house would be established here and it would be supported uh, by uh, donations from large black mega churches. Uh, that did not eventuate in, <clears throat> I think three or four years ago, we did some strategic planning uh, and decided to become a support organization, quite similar to the Bird Tree uh, and Garden Club, who I will not talk about in comparison uh, here. Uh, but again, our, our mission now is to support the institution in its efforts to become a more diverse and more inclusive uh, place and perhaps uh, prod them a little bit faster periodically than they might uh, want to move, while at the same time, uh, running a series of programs, particularly speaker uh, programs. If you go on our website, and it's aaheritagehouse.org, but I, if you want to take that down later, just come by and scan this scan code, uh, and you can get that, uh, bring the website up, and you'll see the speeches we've had over the last uh, three years or so. And, we, and the goal there is uh, primarily uh, history. Uh, we believe you should get the history uh, correct uh, in this country in order to get uh, the narrative correct, in order to get the understandings uh, correct. And if you don't have correct understandings, you can't have correct relationships. Uh, that is our uh, view. And if you go to our website, you'll see a lot of scholars. And uh, we do uh, focus more on scholarly work than we do on entertainment. Uh, and Again, I think you'll find it interesting, and this is probably a really long answer to a question. That's fine. You mentioned that the African American Heritage House has been in existence for three years. If you look ahead five to ten years, where do you hope to see the house and the programming that you offer through the house? Uh, that is a challenge for us right now. Uh, we rent a house for use at right on the brick walk, right up the street here at 38 Clark, right at the corner uh, of Foster, and we have receptions uh, in there for speakers. Uh, we do not have a full-time presence uh, in that house. In fact, it is a, the home for the Minority Symphony Fellows, uh, and we share that facility with them. And we probably, during normal times, use uh, two afternoons a week uh, in there. And, and here's the challenge. The challenge is not to buy a house. I believe we have uh, enough friends and supporters and a wherewithal to do that. The issue now for me is to staff the house. Uh, and I believe that until we have a critical mass of African Americans uh, on the ground, uh, it, it makes sense for us to delay uh, the purchase and building of a house. <clears throat> you have to, pardon me, I, am, uh, I have two maladies here. I have uh, <clears throat> allergies, uh, violent ragweed allergies, and I'm still sore also from Esther twisting my arm uh, to do this talk. I'm pretty strong. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that you'd like to see, obviously, the population of African Americans grow. What ideas? suggestions do you have as you're working on different plans to increase the presence? Uh, well, we ask. And what are the, one more, what, what yeah. are the barriers that prevent it from growing faster? Okay, you I think? can only do two at a time. You That's saw, just you two. Know, you, saw <laughs> Governor, you saw Governor Perry uh, tank on three questions, so I, I don't plan, I don't plan to, to repeat that. Um, uh, we, we ask the question all the time, why should African Americans come here? Uh, and we want the answer to be the same reasons you uh, come here. If you love literature, if you love music, if you love dance, if you love religion, uh, you come here. 
but we also ask, will you come here and be comfortable here? Uh, and that's where it gets a bit problematic. Uh, because as someone mentioned at the, at the talk today, we've had people who've come, they've enjoyed it. They said, but I get tired of people turning their heads and looking at me when I walk down the path. Uh, it's the concept of the other uh, in our society, and until you get critical mass uh, of any people, uh, you're going to be the other. Uh, and I, I think we're making slow, steady progress uh, in that direction. Now, in terms of what we can do, uh, we cannot afford to do the marketing that the institution uh, can or should be doing. Um, our view is that the institution for a long period of time has said, uh, you know, we're great, uh, you know, the best and the brightest come here, we'll open our doors, come on down. Uh, we don't believe that to be modern marketing. Uh, and neither do we believe that to be the best way to engage others. And so I think that uh, this administration um, is gearing up to, more, to do more outreach, to do uh, more engagement uh, through all sectors of, of society, not just African uh, Americans. And I, I think, uh, and we will help them and support them to the extent we can in that process. Do you know what the institution's expectations are of an African American presence and how it has supported your efforts? Well, they haven't divulged a quota to me or anything like that, <laughs> uh, but uh, their aspirations are clearly expressed uh, in, their, in their strategic plan, uh, and there it indicates that they want a more diverse, they want the grounds to reflect society, and that's all we can ask. Okay, two questions from the audience. First two hands. Ben, can you? I think the young lady back there had the hand up first. And the gentleman over here. <clears throat> Isabel Wilkinson <clears throat> has written a book called Cast, which is very popular. My question to you is, can you explain the difference between caste and racism? Are they related? Are they different? Uh, you know, when I... Uh, was superintendent of schools in Atlanta, uh, I noticed that white parents did not want their children to go to school with poor black children. But then I noticed that middle class African Americans didn't want their children to go to school uh, with poor black children. And so race and class and caste uh, are in fact, they're, they're not exactly uh, the same, but they're sometimes uh, so close that you can't tell uh, the difference. Uh, and clearly the examples she uses of India uh, are clear uh, in the book. Uh, I do not think the book is her best work, uh, quite frankly. Uh, I think The Warmth of Other Sons is, is a much better book uh, than that. And uh, I think if I wanted to, uh, because uh, you could also be critical of the book because it does not uh, discuss the Asian uh, experience here uh, in the United States, uh, which is significant. Our, our first speaker uh, of the season, and again, I urge you to go look uh, on our website, is one quarter Chinese. Uh, and she started her talk uh, by saying that Chinese are not genetically uh, disposed to running uh, restaurants and laundries. <laughs> And it was, and she did, she wove a wonderful tale about the policies of the United States, which drove them uh, into, <clears throat> excuse me, restaurants uh, and laundries. But I, I'm getting away uh, from your question. I, I don't think there's great differences between caste uh, and racism. Uh, but you know, you can make technical arguments, and I'm sure there are academics here. Uh, who would, but if you're in the lower caste or if you're the brunt of racism, I don't think it makes much difference to you. A young lady with a mask on up there, yes. You, is your mic on? I mean.
Is it working out? Yes. Okay. Um, you've used the phrase critical mass several times. Um, and I guess part of the question is, what would you define as critical mass? Are we talking about, um, you know, one week or two weeks? Because we've had programs over the years where I know that there have been more uh, black um, mm -hmm. visitors, if you will, who've come mm -hmm. here. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess the question is, why should um, people come to a place where they don't feel comfortable? And what is it that the institution, or whatever you do, can do to enhance, create some level of comfort? Uh, well, our goal is to create an environment where they are uh, comfortable. And there's clearly some chicken and egg here, but to the extent that we can do outreach and engagement and get more people on the grounds and that have some percentage of them be repeat customers or repeat repeaters here uh, on the grounds, that then, you know, I thought you were going to ask what is critical mass, and that too is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, Elaine and I probably don't need a critical mass uh, that some others do because we've spent most of our lives in a different world uh, than most of my colleagues and friends, particularly my African-American friends. One more question. <clears throat> right here. This is Ben. Ben's my, my next door neighbor and her grandson. <laughs> I guess this question is still in tar target because it is the African American Heritage House. Um, I've always had a special interest in the Underground Railroad. And connect me, correct me if I'm wrong, but my sense is that this particular area has a rich history in the Underground Railroad. I would love to see some sort of tour emanating from Chautauqua, possibly from the African American Heritage House, mm -hmm. taking us to sites. Yeah, um, let me say first, you are correct. Uh, this is an area where there were a number of stops on the, <clears throat> the Underground Railroad. Uh, if you go to the park in Jamestown, I forget the name of the park, uh, there is a memorial uh, to the Underground Railroad where there were three statues and one got stolen. Uh, and so now there are only two statues uh, there. But we also have Again, some conflicting reports that there's a house here on the grounds uh, that was, and part of our archival research is to keep digging uh, into those types of things. Now, you talk about it would be a good idea to have a presentation or a program uh, on that. That is the kind of presentation or program that we would put in a house uh, as opposed to on the platform. Uh, yes. We, we, we are collecting artifacts now. Uh, people have donated uh, artifacts to our house. Uh, one, for example, is a slave sale certificate that's been authenticated by Sotheby's uh, of a quote unquote female winch in New York City uh, in the late 1700s. And so we wanted to make it clear that the buying and selling of slaves was not necessarily a Southern uh, phenomenon. Uh, that it occurred in New York City uh, as well. And we are collecting other types of memorabilia. And as if and when we do get a facility, uh, we will be programming exhibits uh, in that facility as well. And thank you for the idea on the Underground Railroad. What changes have you seen as far as Chautauqua's view on diversity since you first started coming in 2011? Well, uh, that's, that's a very difficult uh, question. I'm, I'm not sure I'm the, the best arbiter uh, of that. I don't think I've seen a ton of changes in stated intent or, or principle uh, as opposed to changes in terms of uh, implementation. There, there's always been sort of a, uh, what I'll call a theoretical liberalism uh, here. Uh, not and, always. Uh, and, well, not always. And I, <laughs> My, you are correct. Uh, my friends have apprised me of that. Uh, but more recently, I've seen uh, people putting money where their mouth is, they're putting resources. Uh, we, knew, we now have a chief IDEA officer at a senior level on staff, and he's working his buns off. Uh, 
uh, trying to do more community engagement, trying to do uh, more outreach, trying to understand uh, what the real challenges are here, and we're doing everything uh, we can to assist him uh, in that process. And we I've were seen panels with you yeah and with Ahmed, and, uh, and we were fortunate enough to be asked to. Uh, to participate in the recruitment process uh, for his position as well. Great. To what extent have you and other African Americans at Chautauqua experienced racism or discrimination? And if so, could you give our audience some examples? Uh, first, let me always do the politically correct caveat by saying that I certainly cannot speak for others. Uh, and their uh, experiences. I can only speak uh, for my own. Uh, my wife and I have not uh, been confronted with any, I think, virulent racial hostility here. Let me say that uh, at first. Uh, I've had to deal with uh, more than a lion's share of what I would categorize as uh, well-intended but stupid questions. Uh, <laughs> I hope I'm not being included and, uh, in that. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I was going to give you a, a, an example, and most of them are based on assumptions. Uh, and we don't understand the assumptions we make about the other. Uh, for example, um, I don't know how many of you have seen uh, Otis Moss's choir uh, on a Sunday evening. Well, inevitably, on a Sunday evening, I get asked whether I'm, speak, I'm, I'm singing uh, that evening or, or not. They're making an assumption that I am a member uh, of the choir. Uh, my poor wife hates for me to say this. Uh, you know, the electrician makes the assumption that she's the housekeeper uh, and ask her whether she's uh, the housekeeper. Uh, little did he know she could have fired him on the spot. Uh, but uh, she suffered through that as well. Uh, and so, uh, uh, again, uh, what I, I, I said earlier, we need to get the history correct, to get the understandings correct, to get the relationships uh, correct. Uh, you know, we love the place. It's a pleasant place for us uh, to live. Our, we love our next-door neighbors, uh, your grandchildren <laughs> and son. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, again, it's, and we want more of our African American friends to experience this environment as well. How does that compare with any um, instances of discrimination that you and your family have experienced in Atlanta? Well, let me, uh, I'll just, you know, if you're an African American in America, uh, you have experienced discrimination and you live under a constant pressure. You know, one of the, my high points of discrimination was back during the Vietnam War. Uh, I was a first lieutenant uh, in the Army at the time. I was sent to the Tank Automotive Command in Warren, Michigan. Uh, I, had, uh, I wasn't an infantry officer. I was a management science officer uh, at that point. Uh, but. Uh, I was in an office with three other lieutenants, all of whom were married, and they told us that there's limited, if any, uh, housing on the post to go get an apartment. Uh, and so they all went out and got an apartment the first weekend or the second uh, weekend. Elaine and I uh, got a list of seven apartments, uh, and I went, in, again, in the middle of the Vietnam War in uniform. Uh, to each of these apartments, and it must have been a fantastic housing market because all seven had just been rented uh, that day. Uh, and so, again, we were forced uh, because we couldn't find housing, and this wasn't a southern base. This was in Warren, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit, uh, Michigan. And again, and it, and it, make, it challenges you as an African American to ask questions like, I'm fighting for my country, is it fighting for me uh, at this point in time? Uh, but you love your country. You know, I, I served, uh, I did my time, uh, and, uh, and we move on. But that is not atypical uh, of the types of discrimination that African Americans face on a daily basis, as long as you're the other. 
uh, and that's that's the challenge. Have has the discrimination that you have experienced in Atlanta, at Chautauqua, whether it's because you're the other, been different in the other areas of the country because you've resided in other regions of the U.S.? Yeah, you know, uh, my wife will tell you we've moved 16 times as befits a person who can't hold a job uh, very <laughs> well. But. Uh, other areas of the country are different, and quite frankly, um, I mean, you're going to find racism everywhere, uh, but the question is, some places you're less the other. Uh, that, you know, I lived in Southern California. I had a wonderful time uh, there. As I mentioned, I lived in the suburbs of Detroit. It was not so a uh, wonderful time, but again, it, uh, it generally is a function of the diversity uh, of the population. Uh, Atlanta has a very diverse population, but it always, but it also has a difficult history to deal with, and the population is totally unwilling to come to grips uh, with its own history. Uh, I see people at school board meetings now holding up signs, do not teach our ch kids uh, critical race theory. They have no idea in their military mind what critical race theory is. Uh, and, you know, critical race theory should be taught in law school, not in elementary uh, school, but that seems to have escaped them. Uh, but it's an area of the country where uh, people refer to the Civil War as the recent unpleasantness. Recent unpleasantness. You know, 150 years ago, but it's the recent unpleasantness. I never heard it referred to as the War of Northern Aggression. I was told that I was going to... Uh, hear that when I moved uh, to Georgia, but that is not the case. Can you tell us about the Mirror Project? I read some of it on your website and thought it looked extremely interesting. Can you inform our audience about how it started and what it involves? Oh, the Mirror Project is a joint project between the African American Heritage House uh, and the institution. It started the year before last, or last year, uh, as a forum uh, for discussion, an online forum for discussion. It evolved during the off season to a monthly book club uh, where we, in essence, read books about social justice and we discussed them each month, but slightly differently than you would in a normal book club. We did not make particular critiques of the authors or whether they, whether they were easy to read or, or not, as opposed to did you learn anything uh, from this? How does it impact you? Does it motivate you uh, to do something else? And we will run it again this year. As a matter of fact, I'm meeting on Friday with Sony, uh, <coughs> uh, Sony Tonami uh, and uh, Ahmet to discuss you know, uh, what form it will be uh, this year. And we certainly will publicize it and invite people, everyone here, uh, to participate if you need yet one more book to read uh, a month. Uh, I was challenged myself uh, <laughs> at times with that. But there are always uh, in, uh, summaries written uh, and critiques, and you can get the essence of the books really by reading uh, those. And the discussions were robust, and we kept them to a manageable size and had multiple sessions. And so we'll do that again this year. Great. Okay, audience, your turn. This gentleman here first. I want to make sure Ben gets his exercise tonight. Right here. I'm riffing off of your comment about the institution isn't doing marketing. So about a week ago on the radio, they mentioned that President Obama's 60th birthday bash in Cape Cod is canceled because of local anxiety about spreading the Delta variant. So what do you think about inviting President Obama and all his <laughs> other high-profile friends, such as Oprah Winfrey, to come here on week 10? <clears throat> well, I had Stacey Abrams here uh, already. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which was an interesting uh, experience. Uh, interesting, of course, what you say about ugly babies. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, I got sort of crossways with the institution on that, and rightly so, because uh, 
I sort of brought in my speaker, uh, and I had a different relationship with Stacy. I was uh, chancellor of the university system, and she was a junior legislator uh, when we formed a relationship. And uh, although it's permanently altered, I, I'm not sure she knows it uh, yet. Uh, and so uh, I asked her to come, and she uh, she gladly agreed uh, to do that. And I just, I think, told the institution a, a week or two before she was coming, and uh, they were concerned, and rightly so, about security uh, issues. And so we are working much more closely uh, together uh, and planning uh, future speakers. Uh, we are in discussion with Skip Gates to come back uh, here next summer. Uh, members of our board have uh, personal relationships with Skip, and we can, oh, okay. <laughs> Well, I bought one of his books, but you know. <laughs> uh, but again, we will try to bring prominent African Americans. And as someone else mentioned, when we do that, uh, we do tend to get more African Americans on the grounds uh, as well. And that gives us an opportunity when they are here on the grounds to uh, hopefully expose them to all the positive aspects of Chautauqua. When we first came to Chautauqua, in 1969, I, where, when I, we first came to Chautauqua. No, I can hear you. I can't see you. Oh, Hi, you're over there. Hello. How are you? Um, when we came in 1969, there were a large number of New York City school teachers here spending the entire summer on a school teacher's salary. Today, 70% of the people who are on the grounds at any given week are here just for one week. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, if the administration is serious about making Chautauqua look more like America looks, the entire America, will it have to make some adjustments to the whole economic picture about coming to Chautauqua? Well, again, you're asking me to speak for the administration, and I am having difficulty speaking for myself uh, right now. Um, as with other things in society, the price uh, of admission here, the price of everything here, particularly the food, uh, has gone up. Uh, and so affordability does become an issue. And uh, again, I think that's something that the administration uh, is looking at. And the concept of shorter stays may become a reality and changing the programming uh, to accommodate uh, shorter stays uh, uh, might be something that's in the future because the average stay today is less than one week. Uh, it, it, it is less uh, than a week. And so, uh, again, they are acutely aware of that and certainly the financial uh, person is. Uh, but, you know, affordability uh, is an issue and it gets to your caste uh, issue and socioeconomic uh, status issue. It is not something that we struggle with, quite frankly, at the African American Heritage House, because we believe there are more than adequate number of African Americans who can afford uh, to come to Chautauqua, because uh, they all go to Martha's Vineyard uh, in, in the summertime. And, and it's still cheaper to go here than it is to Martha's Vineyard uh, in the summertime. Looking towards this thing called a post-racial America, uh, is it, where do you see African Americans mostly moving up? In what fields of our economy are they making inroads? Because I noticed journalism has like exploded with all kinds of minority people. Mm -hmm. So what areas, where's the best opportunity? Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's uh, an interesting question to which I'm very tempted to uh, give a facetious answer. You notice the explosion in journalism as it's dying and as the salaries <laughs> Uh, are going down uh, in, in journalism. But clearly, uh, the future of this country is, uh, at least, I, you know, I'm an electrical engineer, I have to admit my bias is here. Uh, but again, from a STEM uh, perspective, and until we can get uh, better schooling uh, for everyone, uh, until we can get to the point where success is not 
predictable by zip code, uh, again, we're not going to see a lot of progress by African Americans uh, in the sciences and in those fields, I think, that are the most lucrative for the future. But I also believe that industry is starting to understand that you may not need a college degree for every job uh, that we have, uh, and that there are well-paying uh, jobs that can put you in the middle class that do not require uh, a college degree. But uh, again, the when you have school systems where they're failing to teach kids how to read and write, uh, that has to be solved before anyone can make progress. By the way, I just want to say that I am personally in awe of Stacey Abrams and what she has done. And I think that we liberals, if you want to call us that, uh, are so grateful to the black community all over the United States who have put themselves on the line. And we hope that more of us will, including me, will be active in trying to preserve the right to vote, which is so critical. You um, ask the question about relationships. But now. my question is, um, what possibilities exist for the funding of schools to be disconnected from the affluence or non-affluence of a particular community. Mm -hmm. I lived on Long Island most of my adult life and in Brooklyn and New York City. And that's why things are so difficult for the poor people. They are getting <coughs> horrible schools. Yeah, on the surface that seems to be the case, uh, I thought it was the case. Uh, when I moved to Atlanta uh, and I had stumbled into becoming a superintendent of schools, I, I should point out I had, I am not a K through 12 educator. Uh, I agreed to run the uh, Atlanta public schools as a favor to the governor and mayor for three months. Uh, there was a uh, search on for a new superintendent and I had run large organizations and so even though I had no background, they said, could you run it for three months? I said, yes. On the second day on the job, the governor's special investigator threw a three volume, 900 page tome on my desk detailing cheating in 75% of our <laughs> middle and elementary schools the largest cheating scandal in U.S. Uh, uh, education history. Uh, and there I was with two days of K through 12 uh, experience. And so my three months turned into three years, seven days, 11 hours and 42 minutes <laughs> of absolute trench warfare. Now back to your question. Uh, poor parents came to me and we had two, as, as I see it in most cities, uh, uh, you have your uh, upper middle class liberal area and your upper middle class conservative uh, area. And there were two schools there that uh, were well financed and well resourced. And the poor parents came to me and said, you know, we want what they have. Uh, and my response was that the parents in those areas provided a lot of extramural support uh, that I cannot match that the only thing I could do uh, was to distribute the resources I had equitably. Uh, and then it dawned on me, I just made an assumption, which was the resources were being distributed equitably. Uh, and so I decided, well, maybe as with my little empirical background, I should do a little research uh, on that. So I had an equity audit done. We were teaching middle school higher math in these two districts and nowhere else in the city of Atlanta. And so I called the chief academic officer in and I said, why is that? And he said, well, the parents in these two districts argued for their children. They wanted their children to have that so they could go to calculus quickly, so they could go to better schools. And so we responded to the parents. And I said, well, that's a good thing to respond uh, to the parents, within reason, of course. Uh, I said, but you per perhaps miss the point of my question. Why aren't we teaching it in the 14 or 15 other middle schools that we have? Well, the parents didn't ask for it. Uh, and we thought maybe that, that kids probably wouldn't take it. 
And so I'm sitting there in a black run school system. And I said, let me just paraphrase what you said to me, which is black kids are too dumb to learn. That's what you just told me. I said, I cannot legislate equality, but I can give equal opportunity in this school system. So I threw the entire curriculum out. I said, if we're teaching it one place, we will teach it every place. If we have languages in kindergarten in these ritzy areas, we're going to have languages in kindergarten in every area. I'm going to give everybody the opportunity uh, to be successful. And, and so I would suggest, thank you, I would suggest to you that before we make an assumption about uh, one area getting more than the other to make sure that there at least every area is getting its fair share uh, and that there are equitable, which is, doesn't necessarily mean equal uh, because equitable may mean uh, disparate responses to disparate needs, uh, but to make sure that the resources uh, are distributed on something other than what the local school board member wants to m improve her child or his child's uh, classroom, because I had to deal with that uh, as well. School boards are, in America are really interesting creatures. You know. What is your perspective on African American and Jewish relations? Well, again, I have to give the politically correct caveat, uh, which and is- And then the real. Yes, which is I cannot speak. Uh, for all African Americans, I can only speak uh, for myself, uh, and even and and not even for the African American Heritage House. Only on issues where uh, we have made policy statements. Now, having said all that, uh, I think these are. Uh, I, I view it as sort of a generational issue: relationships between uh, Jews and African Americans, and particularly as it relates to Israel. Uh, when I grew up, uh, well, that's making an assumption that I have, uh, but uh, let's say back in the, the 60s, there was a certain romanticism uh, to Israel. Uh, you know, we read uh, Leon Uris, uh, you know, we read Exodus, we saw movies, it was the triumph of the small uh, over the large, uh, and it's something that resonated with the American psyche. Uh, and we became uh, Israeli supporters, and that in many ways, uh, you know, uh, bled into our relationship with our Jewish uh, friends. Now, I had a very different uh, relationship because uh, I was <laughs> president of a Jewish fraternity. So <laughs> 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 How did that happen? Well, <laughs> and the vice president was from Mississippi, so <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. Uh, but younger people today, uh, particularly younger African Americans, don't necessarily see Israel in the same light. They see Israel uh, through the lens of Israeli-Palestinian relations, uh, and you know, and the question that they will ask and they will throw in to me and my generation is, has Israel lost the moral high ground? Uh, because my generation just gave it uh, the moral high ground based on its struggles and the parallel of its struggles uh, with our struggles. But uh, younger African Americans will see Israel in many instances as an oppressor. Uh, and so that's something we have to deal with because certainly the Jewish community has been great friends uh, with the African American community and it's something that we should not, a relationship we should not squander. Uh, and again, uh, I've always pr uh, been a proponent of the view that oppressed peoples should not fight with each other. Uh, they should fight the oppressor. Juice. Do you see opportunities for collaboration here at Chautauqua with the Jewish community? They're different. There is the Everett House, Kabat House, and the Hebrew <clears throat> Congregation. Well, uh, 
Uh, I listen to Edith Everett. Uh, she has strong opinions, often articulated. Uh, and uh, we have an email exchange going at, at all times. And she's giving me great uh, advice, uh, particularly about the she building. She saved you and, money, right? The, yes, about the building and running of a house uh, and just what it takes uh, to do that. And I'm certainly appreciative of it. Um, in terms of relationships with any group, one of the things that we had to do at the African American Heritage House is to establish an identity. Uh, and you know, no one wants to have a relationship unless you can identify yourself. We had our very first joint event with the LGBTQ community uh, this year. It was a mixer that we sponsored for all of the art students because we felt the art students were living in silos and not interacting with each other, and we brought them uh, all together. They, were all, they all had to be vaccinated uh, in order to be there, and we didn't <clears throat> invite the dance uh, people because they were a little young, but uh, the opera, the theater company, the symphony people, the visual arts uh, people were all invited to this mixer, and they all had a great time, and we'll continue with joint events, and we'll continue to look for opportunities to do events uh, with others, and we'll also look for opportunities of community outreach. Um, we're, <coughs> pardon me, uh, we're, I'm, I'm not dying, it's just allergy. Uh, I'm sure there are enough doctors in the audience. Aha. Uh -huh. Agua mineral. Thank you Gracias. so much. <laughs> Thank you. I've learned next time to bring water. This is the first warm. Uh, I was, uh, Elaine and I had both uh, said that we were going to bring water, but we are of an age that we thought about that once we got halfway here. Uh, <clears throat> now, where was I? <laughs> where were you? Um, <laughs> this, this is a, pro a mutual problem. About the collaboration. <laughs> yeah, about the collaboration uh, and, and the identity. outreach. Uh, for example, we have a, uh, the, and, and we're supporting the institution on this. The, uh, black violin is coming. They're going to bring a lot of kids uh, from Erie uh, to see that. They've asked us to host them uh, for a dinner and a luncheon, and we're going uh, to do that. Um, I've reached out using uh, commercial connections uh, to Cummings Engine, and I had them provide volunteers for our Phyllis Wheatley uh, event. And so we're trying to do more outreach uh, with local communities because, uh, again, <clears throat> you know, the view we, we hear as well as others hear the view of local communities about Chautauqua. Uh, we had a group of people come uh, from the Jamestown Justice League and they said, you know what, we've all been here. We've all been here for either a wedding or our graduation, uh, but we don't come back. It's sort of unwelcoming to us and we're trying to show them it's a welcoming place as well. Is there a significant number of African Americans who want no part of white acceptance? And if so, why, why not? Well, you know, that might be a sort of a loaded preface question, you know, which is, uh, you know, when did you stop beating your wife? That's that kind <laughs> of, uh, of question. Uh, so, but the, uh, the question to me is, you know, why do I need anybody's acceptance? Uh, I don't want to have to be hostile about it. I'm not being hostile uh, about it. Uh, some people think I'm hostile. Uh, but uh, ag again, there, there are certainly people who totally reject relations uh, with the white community, which is, uh, and uh, again, they manifest in anger. Uh, and uh, you know, the anger is based on their lived experiences and the lived experience of others that has been communicated uh, to them. Uh, but the whole concept that you must accept me uh, is a concept rooted in the concept of the other. Uh, that, okay, I will accept you even though you are uh, the other. <laughs> well, even I would say, you know, thanks. I yeah, really appreciate that. Uh, does a lot for me, uh, but uh, I, again, you know, there, I recognize that the hostility uh, exists, and I would hope that it, it wouldn't. Uh, 
but <clears throat> again, I, I don't know that I need to be accepted other than as a human being uh, in, in this world. You know? <clears throat> My last question, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience, is what meaning does Black Lives Matter have to you, and do you feel that this movement is a positive one? Oh, I, I definitely feel that it is a positive uh, in spite of the way it's been portrayed uh, in the media. We have uh, a Black Lives Matter speaker here several years ago. It is, in, again, in spite of what you read, it is a very nonviolent uh, movement. If you look at our platform, uh, we had a talk by DeRay McKesson, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, uh, this year. And I would encourage you to go listen to it it is a very dispassionate talk. Uh, it is not a fiery, passionate talk about anything. He talks about police killings, and he doesn't talk about police killings of black people. He talks about police killings, period. Um, and it's an amazing set of statistics that people in this country do not understand. Uh, you hear about six or seven police killings a year, high-profile killings. There are probably 1,100 to 1,200 a year. You were told that 2020 was a year where change was made because of George Floyd's uh, murder at the hands of the police. There were more police killings in 2020 than any year since 2013, and they continue. Uh, and then there's this view of, well, maybe they deserve it. They're a bunch of criminals. Uh, if you look at <clears throat> the sources uh, of police killings, and again, independent of race, it's mostly domestic disputes. 95% of the calls that police answer have nothing to do with crime, but yet we send armed individuals to 95% uh, of, the, uh, of the incidents, and then we even give them armored personnel carriers, AR-15s, and bazookas uh, as, as well. And so what's the next category? The next category is traffic stops, and I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but the crime is very little. Police killings of people uh, perpetrating crimes is very small. But, you know, everybody says that's your problem. You live in the inner city. Wrong. Police killings in the inner city are going down. Police killings in the suburbs are going up. You can get all the data on, <clears throat> on go look at the talk. DeRay McKesson will give you uh, sites for websites there. You can look at your community, what's happening uh, in terms of police killings uh, in your community. And again, it's not a comment on whether they're justified or not. It's, uh, you know, I think it's pretty unjustified domestic disputes and traffic stops, uh, and that's the majority of them. Uh, and then we have to be armed because people kill police. Well, uh, the major cause of police death is suicide. Uh, the second cause, of, major cause of police death is COVID-19. So the number of policemen being killed by all the criminals uh, is very, very small in this country. <clears throat> okay, uh, next now we'll open it to the audience. Ben, the gentleman in the blue shirt. By the way, before we do that, since this is the end of the formal, formal part, thank you so much. <clears throat> There. Thank you for having me. Wait, wait. P please stay if you have questions. I'm sorry I had to cough questions. my way through this. But. Uh, I, I've please. attended most of the porch meetings on Sundays this summer. And yes, I was, I don't know if the word is flabbergasted today, but I was brought up short. There was a middle-aged uh, black woman there today. And she made the statement and used the word, I'm sick of all this, and I don't want to discuss it any further. I just want to come to Chautauqua and have a vacation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, a lot of us come here to have meetings like this and get a little dose of activism and encouragement, <laughs> but how do we prevent uh, the white community, how do we prevent ourselves from having black individuals being tokens or representatives of black experience outside the gates? How do we just have them be 
like us, here for a vacation, whatever that constitutes in their mind. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you're asking me for the elusive. If I had the answer uh, to that question, we would try and promulgate it. But again, that's the same, at you. that's the aspiration I have for all of my visitors. That's the aspiration I have for African Americans in America uh, in, in general. You know, it shouldn't be hard to just exist uh, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, to not have the pressures of society feel like they're crushing you, whether it's rightly or wrongly. And you do seek havens uh, from that, uh, which is why <clears throat> uh, you know, the thing that argues for an African-American heritage house is a place to go where you can, particularly in times such as uh, post-George Floyd's murder, where you want to go and talk uh, and feel relaxed and not be judged and not have it, the weight of society uh, on your shoulders. And <clears throat> uh, the other reality, and I, I've mentioned this and uh, you've heard it, uh, is that black people look at other black people very differently than white people look at other white people. Uh, when you see a white idiot, uh, and there are a few. I mean, I, 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 I will admit some have been elected to higher offices. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> when you see a white idiot, you will say, there's an idiot. Uh, when a black person sees a black person acting up, it puts pressure on us uh, because we feel a certain responsibility for all black people. And, you know, and I don't know whether that's the same feeling in the Jewish uh, I, I community. I think it is. Yeah. I definitely okay. think it is. All right. But that's not the general feeling of the white, average white population. And so, uh, again, you know, we, we want places where we can be comfortable. Uh, and it doesn't mean we want to be hostile uh, to everyone, but I want to be able uh, to relax knowing that I'm not particularly being judged by anyone other than my wife, and that's certainly harsh enough judgment uh, <laughs> at, at times. Uh, but again, just somewhere to go uh, and relax. You know. I, I have a question. Sorry, I'm way over here, Errol. Thanks. Oh. Thank you for doing this. This is great. My question actually has to do with a few years ago, uh, the actors who were here had gone off grounds Right? A lot of people probably remember when this happened, right? Yep. The actors went off grounds and ran in and came back. They were celebrating their first opening night, and then when they came back, the police followed them back in, mm -hmm. pulled the guy out of the... I mean, they came in with Andrew Barber right behind them. I don't, I don't need to go through the whole story, but it was this <coughs> incredible moment of racial profiling you know, that, that is outside of, outside of our... You know, outside of the gates of Chautauqua. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question to you... And it's, it's kind of a broader question, but it, to you and your role as in leadership in the community here, um, is what are some of the different ways that either the institution or the AAH house or whichever way this might be happening are starting to have those conversations? I know Robert Franklin had, was here at the time, but those sort of conversations with the larger community outside of the gates um, that really pushes back against profound levels of racism in this part of the state mm -hmm. and in this part of the country. So I'm just wondering if you guys are doing anything in that sort of expansive way, and if you are, what it is or what it could be. Yeah, you, you've made, uh, again, an assumption that a lot of people make about our work and our efforts here, and that there are a lot of gerbils turning our wheel. Uh, and, there, and there are not. Uh, which is one of the reasons uh, we're not going to get a house uh, in, in the short term. Uh, there's but only so much we can do. Uh, I think, uh, again, we bring things to the attention uh, of the administration. They have responded, and I think they've been proactive. I mean, I know Deborah Sinea Moore has gone out of her way to go out into the community, uh, again, to show that we're sort of normal people. But again, this is... It, it's a reflection of assumptions people make about the other. And our whole society is based on these assumptions uh, about the other. Uh, and until you, as I said, get your understandings correct, which you can only get from getting history uh, correct, we're still going to have these problems. Uh, and I sound like a broken record. I've said this in many forums. 
you know, we have and we teach in this, uh, this country a common core in math. We teach a common core in science. We have no common core in history because we cannot agree on what history is. You know. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I have, uh, this is going to sound really, really strange. Uh, I have great respect for the daughters of the Confederacy. What they did following the Civil War into the 1920s is absolutely amazing. Uh, they took hold of every textbook that's ever published. Uh, if it said that the Southerners were traitors that, uh, and that they rebelled against the United States as opposed to fighting for states' rights, that, that book was trash. Uh, they had a memorial built in Arlington in the 1920s with President Wilson uh, looking over it. Uh, and I might have gotten it timing slightly incorrect there, but again, they were so powerful in rewriting history, which is why we cannot come to grips with history today. And even and the absolute downside of all this is you see uh, Texas trying to re rewrite history uh, even further. Uh, and so, uh, again, until we can get the history right, and if you go to our website, you'll see a lot of historical data about how the structures of society that we take for granted today or that we didn't notice today impacted the marginalized. Uh, we talk about the suburbs and the explosion of the suburbs and Levittown, Pennsylvania was the first great suburb. Uh, the FHA, an arm of the federal government made it very clear that they would not underwrite a mortgage for anyone other than of the Caucasian race. Uh, and so there were no minorities in Levittown, no minorities to, to experience the explosive growth in value of their home, to, exp uh, to experience the growth in personal wealth uh, due to land. Uh, and uh, again, you, you see the uh, and I forget, we had the speaker here, the institution had a speaker this year, and talked about the distribution of wealth in America in 1950 versus today. And in 1950, it looked like a football with a large middle class and very few at the top, very few uh, at the bottom. Uh, and today, uh, you know, the, the top 10% uh, of, of the people in this country control 80% of the wealth uh, of this country. Uh, and I know that, uh, but I am at heart a capitalist. Uh, I, uh, I think there's no better system, but I also think that it can be improved uh, and there has to be better what is now becoming known as stakeholder capitalism. Uh, and the only stakeholder cannot be just the share owner uh, in that. And you see large uh, funds now taking that view. If you, uh, something very seminal happened uh, this year. Uh, it's never happened in my time in corporate America. Uh, at Exxon, the director's slate was, uh, part of it was rejected uh, and dissidents were elected to the Exxon board. Uh, five years ago, that would have been unimaginable. Uh, but they, they ran on a platform of saying that Exxon management has ignored climate change as an existential threat uh, to the corporation and that they wanted to make sure that that voice was heard in the boardroom and the majority of people, uh, particularly large investors, voted with them. And I had never seen that before in my corporate lifetime. Three minute warning and the bus will be pulling up, but stay as long as you want. We're here to have your questions answered. I have to walk my dogs at 10. I want to make that <laughs> We might be done by a quarter okay. of 10. Question. What I uh, hear, I'm. Sorry, ben, you have a mic. What oh, I what oh. I hear is uh, <clears throat> you have to get the everyone in agreement with the history, but there's a lot of uh, concepts that are being mixed here. Unconscious bias is one of them, mm -hmm. and since Black Lives Matters, a lot of this is a maybe a more of a suggestion than a question, but it could be turned into a question easily. 
Since Black Lives Matter, a lot of institutions now have unconscious, unconscious bias questionnaires now that they that they ask their they mandate their employees mm -hmm. to to complete, and mm -hmm. it reveals a lot of things, not mm -hmm. just about racism, but age bias and sure. all these things. And uh, along with the history that you're doing, uh, seeing that unconscious bias is closely allied mm -hmm. with that, have you considered at least creating mm -hmm. a link to unconscious bias questionnaire that somebody could complete? I believe one of our readings last year was on unconscious uh, bias. And one of the, our website, and again, if you can scan this if you wish to go out, um, <clears throat> we're, is, is in a constant state uh, of design and flux. And we're thinking about putting resources on there for people to use, to utilize that, uh, you know, whether it's readings or whether it's talks uh, by others other than our own speakers to put those out there uh, as well, or questionnaires. Good question. Thank you. <clears throat> this is a young lady right there. And then back to yeah. We'll get you a generational question here. <laughs> I have a question and a comment first. Mm -hmm. First of all, I did watch your first speaker. I thought she was so amazing. Um, and I have been trying to get her book. Um, they didn't have it at the bookstore. So I ordered it on Amazon, and it's, I think it must have been delivered to somebody. So if anybody <laughs> has the book, <clears throat> anyway. Um, the, so I have this burning question. What f Jewish fraternity were you the president of? <laughs> and how did that come about? Uh, well, let me answer the first question <clears throat> first in terms of how did it come about. Uh, it was really sort of eye-opening for me. I went to Carnegie Mellon. Uh, there were no black fraternities on campus uh, at Carnegie Mellon. I probably would have joined uh, one of those. Uh, so I went looking at other social organizations, uh, and that process in itself was eye-opening for a young man who had been taught that the world was black and white. Uh, and I saw fraternities that wouldn't take Catholics, that wouldn't take Jews. Uh, and as I was looking with my friends, I remember saying to, to one of them that, do you mean you people do this to yourselves as well? <laughs> uh, and so uh, Beta Sigma Rho uh, was the fraternity uh, on campus. It was later taken over by Pi Lambda Phi. Uh, uh, but I'm going to a reunion in Palm Beach uh, next April uh, from the class of, uh, I think, 1965. Yeah. <clears throat> The young lady there had a question. <clears throat> Hello. OK. Um, it, I get the impression that lots of people want to assign work to the African American Heritage House. I, you may have to remove oh. your mask a little I'm bit. I'm vaccinated. Okay. Um, I imagine people want to assign a lot of work to the African American Heritage House to solve all the problems. Um, and what I wonder is if, like, anti-racism training for the broader Chautauqua populace might be something that would be very helpful <coughs> and not an assignment for the African American mm -hmm. Heritage House. I guess maybe my question is, what would you have as a wish list if you were assigning what you would, some work you would like done to other mm -hmm. organizations or parties at Chautauqua? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, that, that's an excellent question. And I, I think it assumes a level of expertise that I may not have. Uh, as well. Uh, one of the things that we fondly say uh, is that, you know, we're doing the work of the institution and we're like, getting a little tired uh, of doing the work of the institution, but the institution is stepping up uh, and starting uh, to do that work. And so we will work with the institution, uh, if nothing more than a foil for their ideas in terms of what we think are the most effective paths forward. But I, I am not an expert in this area. In this area, Lynn. Oh, 
Okay, so I'm feeling like we're sitting with the Rosa Parks of Chautauqua. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, I think what you and Elaine have done and had the perseverance is just inspiring. And um, we've been worrying and wringing our hands about these issues since we've been coming. We've turned to black preachers and asked, you know, you come every, I mean, we've had wonderful black preachers mm -hmm. and, you know, would you bring your congregants and so forth? And they all say the same thing, which I think even we as Jews say, um, to be the only within a, I mean, I was raised as the only Jewish person in my school, except for my sister. So I feel like um, because of the perseverance and the dedication you and Elaine have shown by being here 10 years and, and having an electrician say that, to, or Otis, you know, are you in Otis's choir and so forth, is inspired. You are inspired. My question to you is, what can each of us, besides being gra grateful, and perhaps donating money to, mm -hmm. which I think we should do. And, and I, I mean, I, I am certainly inspired to do that. What else could we do for you all? Because I don't want this opportunity to, I'm so grateful to Esther for getting you to come and for you being willing to do this as we have assaulted you with all our questions. <laughs> it's been a phenomenal experience tonight, but I don't want us to walk away just feeling, oh, it was another great yeah. Chautauqua night. Um, <clears throat> let me, before I answer uh, your question, say, uh, you, know, you know, my wife and I are, are not on a, a particular crusade. Uh, we just want to live somewhere to be happy, uh, and we'll do things around us to improve our happiness. Uh, which, which, is, which is what we do. The question, what do I do, is a, or what should I do, uh, is a question that I often hear that's very difficult uh, because I don't know what your particular circumstances are. I don't know what your lived uh, experiences are. Uh, but I would encourage you to listen to the speech by Eddie Glott uh, a few weeks ago because uh, <clears throat> he answered that question uh, in a way I had never heard it answered uh, before. And uh, again, I'm going to not do him justice by trying to recreate his answer. But what he essentially said is, envision the world you want for yourself. And then if it's not that way for everyone, whatever aspect of that world you're looking at, then work to make it so. If you say you want a just world and you believe that that would make you happy to live in a just world, then one could ask, how can you live with the present criminal justice uh, system? Uh, and then work to change that. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of introspection here, uh, you know, not everyone is going to march, not everyone is going to hold a placard, not everyone is going to give speeches, but again, it's a matter of what's the world that you want, uh, and what will make, what makes you happy, uh, and make sure that everyone else shares in that world as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? Ben's getting his 10,000 steps in for the day, <laughs> but he doesn't need them at his age. Ben. Hi. Um, my question is, I heard you talk about your collecting history, and I'm wondering what the scope of the history is. At first I thought you meant history of black people in New York State, and then I thought maybe it's just people around Chautauqua. Um, I'm from Middletown, 
-hmm. And in my town, we were gonna do a history thing mm -hmm. um, about our town. And as I have been looking, the town itself has recorded history that affected black people that most people in the town don't know about. <clears throat> um, how can we get that information to you? Do you want it? Oh, certainly. Okay. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's things like um, slaves in New Windsor, mm -hmm. um, New York, were freed, but they weren't freed all at once. Their children were um, kept as indentured servants until they were 18. And then as they got to be 18, they would be freed. So even though they were freed before um, the Civil War, they weren't freed mm -hmm. for 30 years after it had, this was the decision of the state that they would be free people. And if, um, if I go to your uh, website and send you the references that I found? Yeah, absolutely, there's an address okay. on there. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, we, we love stories, all of us love stories, we learn from stories, and history is nothing more than, in many ways, his story, uh, as opposed to her story uh, at, at times. And so, uh, again, as we said, our focus is to present history through the eyes of marginalized people and to get people to understand the structural, pardon me, <clears throat> the structure of today's society is a result of really policy decisions, primarily by the United States government. Uh, uh, some of us now collect Social Security. Uh, <clears throat> the southern states did not want Social Security. Uh, he, this is in the height of the Depression, and Roosevelt wants to put it in, but they don't want it, but they reluctantly accepted it, uh, and, but history doesn't point out why. Well, they don't tell you in school why, but the history says they've said there are three conditions, uh, and I'm going to have my Governor Perry moment here. Uh, one, you could, it had to be done in block grants and administ administrated, administered by the states themselves, and there's great data on showing that it was administered very differently in Mississippi than in Illinois. Uh, two, there could be no mention of civil rights in the Social Security legislation. Uh, and three, which was the real winner, it could not apply to domestic workers and farmers. So when the Social Security was implemented, uh, it did not apply to the vast majority of African Americans. Uh, again, this is just part of our untold history. And the irony was that wasn't changed until the Republican Party so embarrassed the Democratic Party, which was hostage, held hostage by the Dixiecrats, that this was in the late 1940s or early 1950s, uh, when in fact it started to be, apply to everyone. Uh, but there's a lot in our history that explains things. If you look at the history of the GI Bill, just look at the history of just about anything, it's tainted uh, by racial decisions, primarily made by the federal government uh, in this country. Uh, but here's the real challenge. The real challenge is we show all of these things, we all say, that's bad. We're not going to do that anymore. We're going to stop doing that. Or we don't do that uh, anymore. But that ignores the historical impact of those policies on a large segment of the population. If you're in some sort of legal case, if uh, you know your car hits me, uh, I seek redress for that. But in America, the hint of redress for the historical uh, wrongs 
is labeled as reparations and we don't want any part of that. Uh, and the liberal community flees from that concept as quickly as the conservative community flees from it. And so it's always seen as the same thing. I'm not giving a big pile of money to anybody. Well, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to take that form. You know, I'd be willing to take equal investment in schools, uh, for example. I'd be willing to take, how about uh, subsidizing college tuition uh, for uh, people who have been impacted. You don't have to. Or some people can make the argument, hey, let the people decide how they want to spend uh, their money. But uh, I am told, and I have arguments with my legal friends who tell me that the Constitution precludes you from discriminating on race. And my answer was, it didn't preclude you from discriminating to put me into this position. Uh, and so now you're telling me I can't get out of it because it's discriminatory. Uh, and that's, that's a challenge. And it's going to be a challenge for the younger generation uh, to cope with because it's not going to go away. <clears throat> uh, hey, Earl. Uh, is this on? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> before I read some of us, uh, I viewed some things a little bit as a, uh, a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in Connecticut, uh, we want to have zoning reform, and uh, uh, the people that have what they have don't want to give anything up, right? The mm -hmm. character of our town, we, uh, we moved here because of the character of our town, we moved here because of the schools, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I, I attended a, web, uh, a webinar uh, with a black person who, whose name I, I regret I can't remember. Uh, so I put the question to him, what do I tell, how do I approach people uh, that say that? And they include legislators, um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, just everyday people. Uh, and his answer surprised me. Uh, I don't know if you can answer my question, because he didn't. Uh, in a way, he said, I don't want you to give anything up. You're a person of privilege. You're a person of power. I, want you to, I don't want you to lose that. I want you to use that to, to affect change. Mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, you know, his question, his answer, uh, to me, was more profound and more useful than the answer to my original question. Even so, I'm putting to you the, uh, my original question. Uh, what's your approach? And you sort of answered it in the last answer. What's your approach to talking to somebody that, you know, why should I give this up? Well, I uh, had the privilege of living in Connecticut. Uh, and I was uh, on a five-acre plot because I could afford to do so, and Connecticut, if you don't know it, has the highest percentage of single-family zoning than any state uh, in the union, which leads uh, to some of the problems that you mentioned. But what are the problems? Um, you take a city like oh, Westport, Connecticut. Um, none of the people who provide services to that community live in that community. Your firefighters don't live there. Your police officers don't live there. Your teachers uh, don't live there. Uh, they don't identify with the community. Uh, they don't go out of their way to help uh, the community. Uh, they're, they're mercenaries. They come in every day. They leave uh, every day. Uh, that's not a sustainable or tenable situation. That's not the community you want. Uh, and again, they will wake up to that one of these days to build affordable housing within the community so that the people who provide the services to them, uh, they're going to have labor shortages. It's going to happen. It's inevitable when you have that kind of structure that you're going to have labor shortages. Or you're going to have to pay astronomical amounts of money for your services, all of which could have been headed off by putting affordable housing in your community. Uh, but you know, history repeats itself. People will learn uh, the lessons, and I'm sure Connecticut will come to its senses one of these days. <laughs> See you, Lau. Well, See you, Meg. Thank you so much again.
Wonderful. And thank you, to, thank you to Elaine who kept you here. Like I said, I was voluntold. <laughs>